Right, so hello and welcome back to Books and Things and welcome to another video and welcome to my April wrap up. Today I'm going to be telling you about all the books that I read in the month of April. So in April I read 18 books, which is a lot. Um, I'm really pleased with my reading month in April, um, especially considering I didn't manage to read more than 10 books um, in January, February or March. Um, but chiefly I managed to read so much in April because I was on holiday for two weeks of April. Um, so I basically read two books in the first half of April and then 16 in the second half of April. Um, but I read a lot on holiday, which was really great. And I read some wonderful, wonderful things this month. So I have many things to tell you about today. So let's start off as always with some classics. Um, I read a couple of Victorian books this month, the first one of which was North and South by Elizabeth Gaskell. This was a reread for me and I listened to it on audiobook. This was my fifth or sixth read of North and South, I think. North and South is probably my second favourite book of all time after A Mutual Friend by Charles Dickens. I love it hugely and it was really, really nice to reread it, especially on audiobook because I'd never listened to the audiobook before. North and South is a Victorian novel all about a young woman called Margaret um, who has grown up in the rural south of England um, and after her father decides to um, leave his position as a clergyman of the Church of England. They move to the north of England to um, a manufacturing town called Milton, which is basically Manchester. And while in Milton, Margaret learns a lot about life in the north, um, about life in manufacturing towns, um, and also meets a man called Mr Thornton, who is a factory owner, as well as befriending several people who work in a factory. And it's basically a glorious combination of a bit of a Pride and Prejudice love story with amazing Victorian social criticism. And I just love it hugely. It is the best and it was such a joy to reread and I love it very 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 much. That's more or less all I have to say about North and South. I just adore it completely. It's one of those books that just makes me so so very 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 happy. I have made an individual book review of it before which I'll link down below but yeah North and South is wonderful wonderful. Would highly recommend the audiobook narrated by Juliet Stevenson. It was very good. Then the other Victorian book I read in April was Orley Farm by Anthony Trollope, which I was buddy reading with Emily from Novel Novels. I'll link her channel down below. I really, really enjoyed Orley Farm. This was a great Anthony Trollope book. I am slowly working my way through all of Anthony Trollope's novels. He wrote 47, and I think this is my 28th, my 29th. Um, Getting nearer to having read 30 books by Anthony Trollope, he did write a lot and I do love his books hugely. So Orly Farm um, is all about various characters who are connected by a, a kind of lawsuit or a legal dispute, I suppose. We know that just over 20 years before the story starts, um, a man died and this man had um, a family, some children from his first wife and then he also had a baby son from his second wife um, and the eldest son from his first marriage thought that all the property was going to go to him um, but after the man's death a codicil appeared um, a will that said that all the property was to go to the baby son um, but there was some dispute about whether or not it was legal however it was eventually decided that all the property Orly Farm should go to the youngest son um, and then we pick up with all of these characters 20 odd years later um, when Lucius Mason the young son um, is in his early 20s his mother Lady Mason um, is in her 40s and suddenly the question about who should really own Orly Farm comes into question again but we're also following a lot of other characters um, and there's a lot of like love stories subplots and other things going on I just really really enjoyed Orly Farm there are so many fantastic characters in it Anthony Trollope is really really wonderful at complicated characters and complicated character relationships there's some fantastic love stories but there's also some really nice like different family relationships being explored. I feel like the relationship between um, Lucius Mason and his mother Lady Mason was really good. Lady Mason is in general a fantastic character and there's also these um, side characters, this family called the Orms who I found really interesting um, and they're a family of three generations but one person in each generation so there is the grandfather and then there is his daughter-in-law because his son died um, very young and his grandson um, and the relationship between him and his daughter-in-law I thought was done really really well but and the relationship between them um, and the way Mrs. Orme kind of treats her um, father-in-law and their friendship and their familiar bond, I thought it was done so well. And there's also these side characters called the Furnivals, this um, um, married couple in their 50s whose marriage is sort of falling apart and then their daughter who is quite interesting and kind of calculating. Um, and I really liked them as a family too. I thought they were really interesting. And there was just a lot of wonderful characters and a lot of wonderful subplots, as well as the central plot being really, really interesting. I like it when Auntie Trollope kind of looks at 
law and inheritance and that's one of those themes which um, is really kind of interesting within Victorian society and interesting within Anthony Trollope's book. So Orly Farm was definitely a really, really strong Anthony Trollope for me. One of my favourites, but I also have so many favourites because I've read so many of his books. Um, but yeah, it was great. Would highly, highly recommend Orly Farm. Then another classic I read this month was The Wisdom of Father Brown by G.K. Chesterton. These are some kind of mystery short stories from um, 1914, I think. So I've read a little bit of G.K. Chesterton before. I've read The Man Who Was Thursday years ago. And I've also read his nonfiction about Charles Dickens, because, you know, I like Charles Dickens. Um, and I quite like G.K. Chesterton, and it was really nice to read these because I really enjoyed these. So this is a collection of some of his Father Brown stories. I gather he wrote a lot of stories focusing on this character, Father Brown, who is a British Catholic priest um, in the early 20th century, who um, is just very, very intelligent and, like, solves lots of mysteries. Um, and not necessarily murder mysteries, but more kind of like Sherlock Holmes-esque, slightly odd situations um, that he gets caught up in and he works out what's going on or he kind of um, manages to get to the bottom of things um, and they're just really really enjoyable and really good fun. I listened to these on audiobook, me and my husband Nick listened to them together um, and we both really enjoyed them and I think they're quite a good like substitute for Sherlock Holmes because we listen to all of the Sherlock Holmes stories on audiobook so it's nice to have like another series of mysteries um, to read and listen to, I suppose. So I really enjoyed The Wisdom of Father Brown um, and I'm sure I'll read some more Father Brown stories in the future um, and I'm quite interested in watching the TV um, series as well, which I've never seen. Um, so those were really enjoyable, another good read for April. Um, and then I also read a couple of Chinese classics this month. Um, so one was this, uh, More Short Stories. This is the true story of RQ and other tales by Lu Xun. And there are quite a lot of different short stories in here, um, all of which were written um, in kind of the 1910s and 1920s in China and this edition um, is translated by Yang Shanyi and Gladys Yang. I didn't hugely love these stories, I feel like I didn't get that much out of them. There were a few stories that I did really enjoy. Um, I liked A Madman's Diary, which was the first story, and I quite liked An Incident as well. I would just say in general that I found these short stories a little bit hard to get into. I'm glad I've read them because I've been meaning to read something by Lucian for ages, but I didn't find that I felt very like engaged with any of them, I suppose. I had a much better time, though, um, with the other Chinese classic I read in April, which was Half a Lifelong Romance by Eileen Chang, which I loved. Um, this is the first book by Eileen Chang that I've read, and I'm very, very excited to read more in the future because this was fantastic. Fantastic. Um, so this is a novel from um, the 1940s um, and this edition that I have was translated by Karen S. Kingsbury um, and this was just amazing. I would really highly recommend this. So this is a book um, which is set chiefly in 1930s Shanghai and it's about the relationship between two young people, a man and a woman, um, who meet and fall in love but kind of circumstances and their lives are against them. I had a kind of like Thomas Hardy-esque tone, I suppose. I feel like that's quite a good way to describe Half a Life Long Romance in that a lot of it is quite sad, but there's also like moments of real happiness and like emotional connection snatched between the sadness um, and the very, very difficult things that these characters go through. And I feel like the way this book looks at like gender and society um, and all the kind of social criticism within it was something that I really, really, really enjoyed as well. So this was a fantastic read, very, very emotional, really powerful, um, really engaging and gripping. And yeah, just, just fantastic. So I'm really excited to read more by Eileen Chang in the future. This was definitely one of the highlights of the month. Um, and yeah, a really, really fantastic classic. So I would highly, highly, highly recommend this. This was wonderful. I also read one Australian classic this month. I read My Brilliant Career by Miles Franklin, which I really enjoyed. This is one of those books where I feel like I read it and I really enjoyed it, but I feel like I will think about it more in the future. And I feel like it's one of those books I will almost enjoy more in the thinking about it than in the reading of it or one of those books that will just like stay with me. I don't know. I don't know if that makes sense. Anyway, this is an Australian classic from 1901 and it follows a girl called Sabella who is 16 at the beginning of the book in her kind of coming of age story, I suppose. Um, and she starts off living with her family um, in kind of rural Australia. She is not super happy, um, but she ends up going to live with her grandmother um, where she kind of has a better life um, and it's about kind of the people she meets, what happens to her in her life and the different places that she moves between and it's about kind of her coming of age, coming to understand herself, coming to understand her place in the world and what it means to be a woman within this world but also that it doesn't necessarily have to mean the same thing for her as it does for other people. Like I feel like the way this book looks at kind of growing up um, and gender and the position of women in the early 20th century or late 19th century Australian society was really, really interesting and something that I really enjoyed. It reminded me a little bit of Little Women, but like if it was just about Joe and 
like if Good Wives didn't happen. And to be fair, there is a sequel to my brilliant career and I don't know what happens in that. But yeah, I really enjoyed this and I feel like it's one of those books, like I said, that I really enjoyed the reading, but also I feel like it's a book that will, I will think about a lot because I feel like it is kind of subversive in some ways. Um, and that was something I really enjoyed about it. So yeah, a really good read. I'm very glad I read this. And you know, exciting to read what I think is probably my first Australian classic ever. So yeah. Would highly recommend this too. Before we move on to some 21st century literature, I also read um, a book for children from the 1960s, slightly randomly, um, which was The Hour Service by Alan Gardner, um, which Nick and I listened to together on audiobook. And this was quite weird. I think I liked it, but I also don't really know what happened. Um, so basically this is a, a story about um, three children um, living in a grand house in Wales. Um, and one of them is kind of the housekeeper's son, um, so he's working class and he's Welsh, and then the other two are English and upper class. And it is a lot about kind of class tensions and the tension between like Englishness and Welshness, but then also some weird, slightly magical things potentially start to happen when they find this um, like table service, you know, these set of dinner plates in the attic, which may or may not have owls on them, and then weird things start to happen and everything gets very strange. It's one of those weird reading experiences because I really enjoy the atmosphere, and I feel like the kind of social criticism and the way it was looking at, like, class tensions um, and kind of culture tensions was really, really, really interesting. But I also don't really understand what the plot was or what happened in the plot. Um, so there were some things about it that I really liked, but my overwhelming feeling leaving the owl service was one of confusion. So, you know, I don't know what that means, but anyway, let's move on to other books. Moving on to some 21st century literature. Um, this month I read one work of commercial women's fiction. I read Mad About You by Varian McFarlane. Um, this is the approved copy, but this has just come out now, um, and I really thoroughly enjoyed this. I really, really like Varian McFarlane. She's one of my favourite rom-com writers. I've read three of her books, and I really love her. I feel like she's excellent at doing, you know, what rom-coms do best, where there is a wonderful, fun love story, but there's also, like, a lot of more serious themes um, being dealt with. This is about a young woman called Harriet, who is a wedding photographer, um, and after a breakup, she ends up moving in with um, someone who previously was the runaway groom at a wedding she had been photographing and um, so they'd never met before but they did have some kind of link um, and by chance they end up moving in together and it's about their relationship um, their friendship whether it might be more um, but also about kind of some difficult stuff in her past to do with a previous relationship and it's really engaging really powerful both fun and moving and yeah just really thoroughly enjoyed this Vara McFarlane is an excellent author then I also read one thriller this month which was If I Die Before I Wake by Emily Koch um, um, this is a really wonderful book and I'm so glad I finally read this. I actually know Emily, we did our Masters in Creative Writing together several years ago and this is her debut novel which came out a couple of years ago. She's had one other novel out since and I think she's got another one out quite soon um, and I really thoroughly enjoyed this. So this is a really, really interesting thriller with a really kind of interesting setup and perspective because um, it's all told from the perspective of a man called Alex who is um, sort of in a coma. So he has locked in syndrome and he... Um, can't move, can't do anything except for think, but he can hear what's happening around him. And he thinks initially that um, he is in this position because he's been in an accident. Um, but as the novel goes on, you realise that perhaps it is not an accident. But everything is kind of told just from Alex's perspective in terms of what people are saying around him in his hospital bed, which is a really, really like fascinating premise and just works so well. Also, the plot itself and the mystery and the solution was fantastic and the characterization was really, really good. So I really love this. This was a wonderful read and just the kind of thriller that I like. Uh, with such a fantastic ending and like so amazingly written and yeah I just hugely love this so I'm super excited to read more of Emily's books in the future and yeah would highly highly recommend this and this month I also read The Coward by Jared McGuinness and um, this was one of the books that I picked up for the disability readathon that was going on in April um, and this was a really really fantastic read I love this this was another highlight of the month for me um, and this is a book which is about a man called Jared and um, it is semi-autobiographical I think. I mean it's about a man called Jared um, who is 26 years old when he's in a car accident um, which kills the woman he is in a car accident with and, and paralyzes him which means that he needs to use a wheelchair um, and because he now needs to use a wheelchair he is unable to go back to where he was living and he's forced to move back in with his father Jack who he hasn't spoken to for 10 years um, and basically it's all about Jared's relationship with Jack and um, their very complicated relationship um, both kind of in in the present and in the past when he was a child so we get kind of 
a lot of flashback scenes and the chapters kind of alternate between Jared in his 20s and Jared um, when he was a small child and when he was a teenager and how his mother's death kind of left such an impact on him and Jack and as well as it being about Jack and Jared's relationship there's also a bit of a love story subplot going on with a woman that Jared meets um, in a coffee shop and it's basically about Jared's life and it is it is really a coming of age story which is something I really enjoyed because it's like the main character is sort of um, I think he's 26 or 27 um, and I feel like a lot of the time a coming of age story is about someone who's 20 and it was actually quite nice to have what was really I thought a coming of age story about someone in their mid to late 20s kind of coming to terms with so many things um, and this was just a really really fantastic read so I would highly highly recommend it I really really enjoyed this one um, and it was yeah just really engaging I also really liked the fact that it was both about Jared kind of in his 20s and also when he was a child. It actually kind of reminded me quite a lot of Patrick Gale, thinking about like rough music and Take Nothing With You, both of which I love a lot and both of which look at like someone when they're older, but also when they're younger and kind of drawing the link between the two. Um, and I feel like if you like Patrick Gale, you probably like Jared McGuinness too. So I really, really love The Coward, would highly recommend it. I should say as well um, that The Coward was very kindly sent to me for review by Canon Gates ages ago and I only just got around to reading it and also sent to me for a review by Canon Gate um, which I also only just got around to reading was the book of former emptiness by Ruth Ozeki which I'm glad I finally read because it's actually also just been shortlisted for the women's prize which is exciting and I really really enjoyed this so I've read one of Ruth Ozeki's books before I read A Tale for the Time Being ages ago and really enjoyed it and it was really nice to read something else by her um, and I really really enjoyed this one too actually interesting to talk about it just after The Coward because both of them do look at like how a parent and child struggle in the wake of one parent's death. Um, so this book is about a young boy called Benny um, and what happens to him and his mother Annabelle after his father Kenji dies. And after Kenji dies, both Benny and Annabelle kind of start to fall apart. Annabelle starts hoarding things in the house and the house becomes more and more cluttered. Um, and Benny starts hearing voices. So inanimate objects kind of speak to him um, and say things to him. And you're never really quite sure whether it's sort of magic realism or mental health, um, but it's certainly treated by everyone around him um, as some kind of mental disorder and he ends up going through psychiatric wards um, and treatment um, and the book is really about kind of Benny as a teenager his experiences and his mother's experiences as their family kind of falls apart but at the same time there's also this like really wonderful strange conceit within this book where the book is being narrated both by Benny in parts but also by a book like a sentient book which is Benny's book which is telling his story because it's a book I don't really know how to explain that in a way that will make it sound really cool rather than just really weird but it does actually really work and I really enjoyed it I feel like it the way this book looks at kind of mental health um, and grief was really really fantastic um, and yeah it was a really interesting read so definitely one I'd recommend then this month I also read Into the Mouth of the Lion by A.B. Chazé this is another book by an author who I know in real life um, which is very exciting and I really thoroughly enjoyed Enjoyed this. It was such a treat to read. It's a really compelling, um, powerful story, really kind of different setting, I suppose, and exploring different things to the kind of thing I usually read. I mean, thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it. This is set in Angola in 2002 during the Civil War, and it's about a woman called Lena um, who is going to try and find her sister who is working on a kind of relief mission in Angola um, and has gone missing. And Lena um, arrives in Angola not knowing what the situation is, not, not knowing what she's doing, really, trying to track down a DJ and ends up kind of getting caught up in a lot of what's going on. Um, and I suppose in a way it's kind of of another coming of age story as well. It's all about Lena kind of coming to understand more about the situation, more about her relationship with her sister, which has always been very fraught, um, and also kind of to understand herself a little better, I suppose. She's very young and in a way she's naive, but she also has this kind of like strength about her. I really enjoyed this. Like I said, it's a really, really compelling read, wonderfully written, um, really engaging. And the civil war in Angola is a bit of the world and recent history that I don't know very much about. Um, so I thought this was really, really well done and I'd highly, highly recommend it. Finally, I read some historical fiction this month as well um, because I do love historical fiction hugely. One thing I read this month was Fanny by Rebecca F. John, which is a um, Reimagining of Les Miserables. I'm going to call it a reimagining rather than a retelling because I feel like that's a better word. I really enjoyed this. It, it's probably a novella in, in length, but in a way it's kind of like a long short story in its kind of premise, I suppose. Um, and it's all about Fontaine from Les Miserables um, and a kind of reimagining or a different possibility 
of her situation, like something else that could come from her situation, I suppose. I feel like the way this looks at kind of Fontaine as a character and her situation and, and the position of women at this point in history was really, really well done. And I think the thing I really liked about this is that it's Fontaine's story without Jean Valjean and indeed without most of the male characters from Les Miserables. Um, they are all taken out and it's really just focused on the women and on Fontaine and on a different possibility for her future, I suppose. And I just really, really enjoyed it. Um, so definitely would recommend this. It's a very quick read as well. Really interesting. I think you'll probably get more out of it if you're very familiar with either Les Miserables, the book or the musical. Um, but in general, it's a really good read and definitely one I'd recommend. Then I also read Briefly, A Delicious Life by Nell Stevens, which was my favourite book of the month. And this was so good, guys. This was so good. This is a proof copy, uh, which the publisher's Picador very kindly sent to me. It comes out in June. It comes out next month now, I guess. And it was so good. And it was so amazing. And I loved it hugely. And it was amazing. Oh. Just one of those books where you read it and you're like, yes, this was written to cater for all of my specific interests. So this strange little book is told from the perspective of a ghost called Blanca. Blanca died in the 15th century when she was 14 years old, and since then she has been haunting a charter house in Mallorca, um, and she just lives there and watches people. Um, but as well as being able to watch what's going on, she can also occasionally disrupt things um, in a sort of poltergeist-esque way, and she can also, like, read people's minds um, and their memories, and to a certain extend their futures um so she's basically this kind of like gloriously omniscient ghost narrator and while she is as a ghost being in this place in Mallorca um, a new family arrive to take up residence in the charter house and this family are, are based on um, real historical figures and so, um, so George Sand the 19th century writer uh, and her two children and also her current partner um, the musician Chopin all turn up in Mallorca. And basically this book is about like what happens in the three months um, that Chopin and George Sand lived in Mallorca, which actually did happen. I was looking this up afterwards and it's a real thing. They did live there for a few months um, and during that time um, Chopin wrote a lot. He composed a lot of music. Um, and the book is basically just about like everything that's going on in these three months while Blanca like watches them um, and kind of gets involved in their lives and slowly falls in love with George Sand um, while being a ghost. And it's just, it's bizarre but it's so good and the way this book looks at like writing and music was fantastic and the way that it looks at like um i don't know all of the complicated social situations and social structures in the 19th century was wonderful and just everything about this was just glorious i just loved this and it was so fun and delightful and like deliciously weird um but also like so powerful and serious and deep and dark at times and i just i just thought it was truly fantastic i would highly highly recommend it so my kind of book it was wonderful just yeah mm, it was so good it was so good everyone needs to read it now probably my favorite book of the year so far right there are still a few things to speak about, so let's move on. Then in April, I also read The Ladies of Grace Are Due and Other Stories by Susanna Clarke. This is a collection of short stories set in the world of Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell, which is Susanna Clarke's first novel. And I really, really enjoyed this. I loved Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell when I read it um, last September, and it was really nice to read some more stories set in this world because I loved the world. And the world was so interesting. Um, and the world's history was so interesting, but also like all the mythology and the lore of the magic of the world was great and um, so I really thoroughly enjoyed these stories too. So these stories are kind of a mixture of like I don't know magical 19th century historical settings and like fairy tale vibes I suppose is the best way to describe this. It's kind of hard to explain exactly what these stories are but in general they were just wonderful and um, I really thoroughly enjoyed all of these stories. They were really engaging um, and it was really nice to like look at different parts of the world I'd come to know and love in the book Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell um, and also to kind of like find out a little bit more about the different ways in which magic works and in which the kind of like fairy world interacts with the real world um, and it was just really really enjoyable so I'd highly recommend this obviously only read it if you've read Jonathan Strange and Miss Norrell because I feel like there are possibly some spoilers but also I just feel like it wouldn't make very much sense to you if you hadn't read Jonathan Strange and Miss Norrell but if you have I and mean, you haven't read this then you absolutely should it was a wonderful read. Finally this month I read three works of poetry which is a lot of poetry for me having not read any poetry for ages um, but I read three collections of poetry um, which I liked to a lesser or greater extent and um, so one thing I read was A Rite of Passage by Don Burry which um, I don't have too much to say about to be honest I didn't hugely get on with this collection it just wasn't really 
really for me. I think one of the reasons why I don't read that much poetry in general is because I'm just a lot fussier about poetry than I am about fiction. If you give me a novel, like, usually I will find something to like about. Um, it's very rare that I rate a novel like less than three stars. Usually I enjoy reading novels. Um, whereas I feel like with poetry, often things just go over my head. I enjoyed some of the poems in this collection, but um, in general I felt that there were quite a few that were sort of shocking for the sake of being shocking um, and there were quite a few that just didn't like interact with me or that I didn't feel like I engaged with at all I suppose. Um, but there were a few poems that I did like. I quite liked the poem Brother and I quite liked the poem Threshold and I quite liked Seasons a Requiem um, but aside from those poems in general most of the poems in here didn't speak to me hugely. I also read Born Between Crosses by Natasha Carfu which I enjoyed a lot more. Um, I really liked a lot of the poems in this collection. I thought they were a really really interesting series of poems um, looking kind of like rural life I suppose and life as a working class woman in Cornwall um, was what the chief kind of focus of this was um, and I like the way it kind of talked about the present but also about like the past um, and the history of certain communities which I really liked. I think my favourite poems in here are probably Swim and Motherbird and um, Water Music and yeah I just really enjoyed this collection I thought it was a really interesting read and definitely one I would recommend and that was more kind of within my taste in poetry, I suppose. But my favourite work of poetry that I read this month was definitely Death Republic by Ilya Kaminsky, which I really, really enjoyed. This was another book that I picked up in April for the Disability Readathon, um, and it's one that I really enjoyed. And I think one of the reasons why I really liked this as a poetry collection was because it has like a narrative thread running throughout it, which meant I just found it a lot easier to understand. Um, and it is in general like really, really powerful. Um, so basically Deaf Republic is um, the story told through poems of the invasion of an unnamed town um, in an unnamed place in the world at an unnamed time, um, where at the beginning of the collection, um, a young deaf boy is killed um, and then everyone in the town pretends to be deaf. Um, so they pretend they can't understand anything that any of the soldiers say to them um, and they kind of take refuge in this fact that they pretend they can't hear um, and that kind of gives them a solidarity and is their way of sticking together. This is like quite emotionally distressing, like I wouldn't necessarily recommend this for everyone, but it's, it's really, really powerful. And I think the way this looks at war and human relationships um, and atrocity is really fantastic. So I would really, really recommend this. Um, it did feel really pertinent to read at the moment with everything that's going on in the world. I would really, really recommend this poetry collection. Um, it's really, really good. And I also think because it has that kind of narrative thread, I think if you're someone like me who doesn't read very much poetry and sometimes struggles with it, I think you might find this much more accessible. So I'd highly, highly recommend this. It was a really fantastic read. And yeah, very glad I finally got around to this. So that's it. Those are the 18 things that I read in April. I feel like I've been filming for about an hour, so I'm sorry if this is a horrendously long wrap up. Um, but I read a lot of great things in April, so that's exciting some real highlights of the month for me um especially probably half a life long romance and briefly a delicious life were probably my favorite books of the month but i read so many good books this month i feel like i just kept rating five stars on goodreads which is always exciting when that happens so yeah do let me know down in the comments what you read in april did you read anything great and what were your favorite books of the month have you read anything that i've read what did you think and that's it for now thank you so much for watching and i'll be back very soon with another bookish video